on World News Tonight. State Operation Myanmar's military has carried out an air attack on a community hall. What will the international response be? More news on this tonight. The IMF's warning. The International Monetary Fund warns of further economic turmoil in the coming months. Volcanic misery. A volcano erupts in eastern Russia covering most of the region in ash, leaving behind apocalyptic landscapes. Egg-tastic zoo. Animals in the zoo of London get together to hunt for Easter eggs. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening to all of our viewers on World News Tonight, where we bring you up to date with the latest happenings from around the planet. We lead tonight with shocking news from our northeastern neighbour, Myanmar. Myanmar's military has admitted carrying out an air attack on a community hall in the central Sagain region that reportedly killed at least 50 people, including women and school children performing dancers. Zo Ming Tung, a spokesperson for the military, confirmed the raid late on Tuesday, saying security forces attacked an opening ceremony for the office of an alleged militia group, opposed to their rule in Pasi Ji village. Witnesses told local media the attack took place early on Tuesday morning, with fighter jets dropping bombs on the community hall. Helicopter gunships followed shortly after shooting at survivors at the scene and hampering rescue efforts. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres strongly condemned Tuesday's attacks, calling for those responsible to be held accountable. He also appealed for those wounded to be allowed urgent medical treatment and access to assistance. The UN Commissioner for Human Rights, Walker Turk, also said he was horrified by the attack, condemning the military's blatant disregard for rules of international law that call for protection of civilians. It noted that the assault followed reports of an air raid in northern Chin state, in which at least nine people were killed and said these violent attacks further underscore the regime's disregard for the human life and its responsibility for the dire political and humanitarian crisis in Burma following the February of 2021 coup. Burma is the country's former name. Myanmar has been plunged into chaos since the military's power grab and its crackdown on peaceful protesters demonstrating against its rule. The UN and rights groups say soldiers in Myanmar have engaged in thousands of indiscriminate killings, arbitrary arrests and torture. Several Western nations, including the US, the United Kingdom and countries in the European Union, has imposed sanctions against Myanmar's military, including on the aviation fuel sector, in a bid to limit air attacks. In addition to the raid on Pa CG, the military also launched an attack on a music concert in northern Kaching state last October, killing as many as 80 people. Over in our neighbouring India, four soldiers were killed in a firing at a military base in the Indian border state of Punjab and a search for the shooters was in progress. An unknown number of shooters were at large at the base in the Batinda city, defence sources told local media declining to name citing the sensitivity of the matter. Four soldiers succumbed to gunshot injuries sustained during the firing incident which took place in the early hours of Wednesday morning, an army statement said. The statement did not mention the circumstances or other details about who was responsible for the incident. The incident was not a terror attack and took place in a canteen, a senior police official in Punjab said. The base was sealed off and a joint investigation with the local police was on, the army statement said, adding that no other injuries and damaged property was reported. Visual showed barricades placed on the road outside the gates of the military station and security personnel deployed outside the boundary wall. An earlier army statement said the incident took place at 4.35 a.m. The military base, about 280 kilometers northwest of New Delhi, houses mostly families of soldiers. The borders with Pakistan is about 100 kilometers west of Batinda. Over in China, after recording one of its worst economic performance in over 50 years during 2022, China's economic recovery seems uneven. Authorities have pledged to set up support to address underwhelming inflation rates and the falling of demand. China's consumer inflation hit an 18-month low last month, while factory gate price declines sped up in March. That was according to official data released Tuesday. It could suggest demand has stayed weak in the country. Chinese officials said its consumer price index rose 0.7% year-on-year, the slowest pace since September 2021. It was also down from February's reading. China's retail and producer inflation has stayed largely low in contrast to surging prices globally. Analysts now think consumer inflation could fall short of Beijing's official targets this year. The government aims for average consumer prices to be about 3% this year. 
The producer price index also fell at its fastest pace in almost three years at 2.5% year on year. Policymakers have pledged to step up supports for an economy which saw one of its worst performances in almost half a century last year. Recent data show China's economic rebound stayed uneven in March. The services sector had a strong recovery, but the manufacturing sector lost momentum due to weak export orders. Moving on to the economic side of things, the International Monetary Fund has trimmed its 2023 global growth outlook slightly as higher interest rates cool activity but warns a severe flare-up of financial system turmoil could slash output to near recessionary levels. The International Monetary Fund on Tuesday trimmed its 2023 global growth outlook. It said higher interest rates are cooling activity, but warned that a severe worsening of financial conditions could slash output to near recessionary levels. The IMF report indicated banking system contagion risks were contained by strong policy actions after the failures of two U.S. regional banks and the forced merger of Credit Suisse. But the turmoil added another layer of uncertainty. On top of stubbornly high inflation and spillovers from Russia's war in Ukraine, the IMF is now forecasting global real GDP growth at 2.8 percent for this year and 3 percent for next year, marking a sharp slowdown from the 3.4 percent growth last year due to tighter monetary policy. The forecasts were marked down by one tenth of one percentage point from estimates in January. The forecast for the U.S. rose to 1.6 percent this year from 1.4 percent from January, as labor markets remain strong. While a major banking crisis was not in the IMF's forecast, the group's chief economist said a significant worsening of financial conditions could recur as nervous investors try to test the next weakest link in the financial system, as they did with Credit Suisse. In a severe downturn scenario, he said global growth could drop to 1% a level that implies near zero GDP growth per capita. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said in remarks at the IMF and World Bank meetings Tuesday that she remains vigilant to downside risks facing the global economy. However, she said it was in a better place than projected last fall, with energy and food prices having stabilized. So I do think um, the, the, the outlook is reasonable. It's certainly uh, stronger, brighter than the last time uh, we had the annual meetings in October. Um, global growth projections are higher than they were at that time. We're seeing diminished inflationary um, projections and um, diminished inflation in some parts of the world. There is extreme yellow dust covering South Korea, the worst the country has seen so far this year. Authorities have issued a caution alert against yellow dust to all parts of the country. That is the second level of the nation's four-tier crisis alert system that issued when there is a risk of a large-scale disaster. Yellow dust covered Beijing and other parts of China on Monday and Tuesday, with sand even piling up on streets, making it difficult for cars to pass. The yellow dust, which originated from Inner Mongolia, quickly spread to 18 regions in China, including Shanghai and Tianjin, on strong northwest winds. This is the fifth time that the country has experienced such extreme levels of yellow dust this year. China's Forestry Science Research Institute analyzed that yellow dust is appearing more often due to low rainfall in the region this year. And this is bad news for South Korea, which will see significant levels of yellow dust also flow into the country on Wednesday. During a press briefing on Tuesday, Prime Minister Han duk su said the highest level of yellow dust so far this year is expected to hit the country. He advised that the elderly and people with respiratory conditions refrain from going outside, but should wear a mask if they do so. At the same time, Prime Minister Han ordered related ministries and local governments to promptly inform the public of the current situation and thoroughly implement safety measures according to the Yellow Dust Response Manual. He also called on daycare centers, kindergartens and schools to either close or have classes shortened in order to thoroughly implement and guide safety measures to protect the children's health. 
He urged organizers and participants to take appropriate precautions in preparation for outdoor events such as sporting events and performances. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. Now taking a look at the conflict in Ukraine, Russian forces pounded frontline cities in eastern Ukraine with airstrikes and artillery attacks, while medical volunteers loaded wounded soldiers into a bus converted into an ambulance to bring them to a military hospital in the city of Dnipro. Fighting raged in the frontline cities in eastern Ukraine Tuesday as Russian forces launched airstrikes and artillery attacks. Footage from a Ukrainian soldier's body cam video released by the Border Service showed fighters launching rocket-propelled grenades and shooting rifles in the destroyed yard of a house purported to be the besieged city of Bakhmut. Ukrainian officials said its forces repelled dozens of attacks as the Russian military kept up its effort to take control of Bakhmut. The battle for the small, now largely ruined city on the edge of Russian-controlled territory in Donetsk has been the bloodiest of the war as Moscow tries to revive its campaign after recent setbacks. Both sides have suffered heavy casualties in the Bakhmut fighting. Near the front line, under the cover of darkness, medical volunteers loaded wounded soldiers into a bus converted into an ambulance to bring them to a hospital in the city of Dnipro. Tens of thousands of soldiers have been killed and wounded on both sides of the conflict since Russia invaded Ukraine last year. The ambulance effort involves rotating teams of volunteers who spend several weeks on call, ready when injured soldiers need transport from the front line. Both trained medics and volunteers without a medical background serve. Donetsk is one of four provinces in eastern and southern Ukraine that Russia declared annexed last year and is seeking to fully occupy. Last week, President Volodymyr Zelensky said troops could be withdrawn from Bakhmut if they ran the risk of being encircled. Kiev and the West say the smashed city has only symbolic importance. Still in Russia, towns and villages in the far eastern Russian peninsula of Kamska have been smothered in ash as one of Russia's most active volcanoes erupt. Authorities have warned the further major ash clouds could appear and pose a threat to international aviation. Large clouds of dark ash rose into the skies of Russia's far eastern Kamchatka peninsula after one of the country's most active volcanoes erupted on Tuesday. It's nine in the morning, said one woman under a darkened sky. The ash is falling. The Shivaluch volcano erupted just after midnight and reached its peak about six hours later. The ash cloud from the volcano covered almost 42,000 square miles, according to the Kamchatka branch of Russia's geophysical survey. <laughs> it created the deepest ash the area has seen in 60 years. Tuesday's event could have a larger impact on the climate than the massive eruption at a volcano in Iceland in 2010, said WWF climatologist Alexei Kokorin. Around 24 hours after the initial eruption, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake struck off the Kamchatka coast, the geological survey said. Russian scientists said the quake was an aftershock from another earthquake that happened on April 3rd. About 300,000 people live on the vast peninsula, which extends into the Pacific Ocean, northeast of Japan. There were no immediate reports of casualties, but experts warn that further major ash clouds could appear. The Kamchatka Volcanic Eruption Response Team also issued a red notice for aviation and cautioned that ongoing volcanic activity could affect international and low-flying aircrafts. Shivaluch's last major eruption happened in 2007. It's had an estimated 60 substantial eruptions in the past 10,000 years. We have some good news for you. On the biotechnological front, local researchers have come up with a ground-baking method to reverse lung cancer cells to a point where they are treatable even after they spread to other organs. Lung cancer was the number one cause of death among all cancer patients in South Korea in 2021, according to a government report. If detected early, lung cancer can be fully cured. 
but the survival rate plummets to 9% once the cancer spreads to other organs. To increase the survival rate, a South Korean research team has developed new technology that potentially enhances how the disease is treated. It's based on reversing cancerous cells into a condition where they can be treated. Before this technology was developed, cancerous cells or tumors in their early stages were not treatable with existing medication. And when they deteriorate, they spread to other parts of the body. The scientists used computer simulations to analyze lung cancer genes and discovered three key genes that can be reverted back to the non-spreading phase which makes them treatable. By inputting components of the lung cancer cells with the ability to spread to other organs into a computer simulation, we found the genetic combinations that can switch the cells back to the stage stripped of metastasis. In addition, this method doesn't just apply to lung cancer. The researchers said the discovery is meaningful in that it paves the way for a new method to treat the disease. Because this treatment method involves changing the cancer cells' characteristics, not killing them, it has a minimal effect on the normal cells. It's a new concept of treatment that's like safely treating diabetes or high blood pressure and maintaining health for a long time. The team plans to commercialize this technology with a local bio company. They expect to carry out a clinical trial on people in the next five to six years. Over in Africa, Sudanese head to streets of the capital Khartoum to protest against negotiations between the military junta government and the powerful paramilitary factions over a transition to democratic elections. Despite the protests delaying talks, the head of the Sudanese army remains committed to the negotiations. Protesters chanted, no militia can rule a country in Sudan's capital on Thursday. After the signing of an agreement that provides for the formation of a civilian government was twice delayed. It was meant to end a political vacuum that followed an October 2021 coup. Huge crowds blocked Khartoum's main roads and marched in several other cities. Security forces fired tear gas in response. Many were seen breaking their Ramadan fasts in the street. The head of Sudan's army said on Thursday he remained committed to a plan for a new transition to its elections. The signing of the deal was postponed for a second time late Wednesday as the army and the powerful Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, continued negotiation over what commitments they would make on military restructuring. The agreement faces opposition from pro-democracy resistance committees that reject negotiations with the military. They have led anti-military protests since the coup. Thursday's demonstrations were the largest seen this year to mark the fourth anniversary of a 2019 sit-in that led to the overthrow of longtime autocratic ruler Omar al-Bashir. The Forces of Freedom and Change, a coalition of civilian parties that back the deal, blamed the postponement on elements of Bashir's outlawed National Congress Party. Tribal leaders who say they feel excluded from the planned deal have threatened to block roads into Khartoum and in eastern Sudan. Rebel groups that supported the coup have warned of chaos if it goes ahead. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Dozens of dead stingrays appear on a beach in Rio de Janeiro this week, sparking confusion and concern in the local community. Biologist Ricardo Gomez from the Mar Urbano Institute argues the absence of other dead species on the beach indicates the incident was likely not caused by pollutants or the lack of oxygen in the water. U.S. President Joe Biden was welcomed to North Ireland by British Prime Minister Rizzi Zonak as he flew in for a brief visit to mark the 25th anniversary of a peace deal that largely ended 30 years of bloodshed. The Kremlin said that Wall Street Journal reporter Etwan Grushkovich had violated Russian law and been caught red-handed after the U.S. State Department officially designated him as have been wrongfully detained by Russia. The United States' commitment to its NATO allies is ironclad, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris said during a meeting with Poland's Prime Minister in Washington. 
The top defense and diplomatic officials from the US and Philippines agreed on completing a roadmap on US security assistance to the Philippines in the next 5 to 10 years. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally tonight, we visit animals at the London Zoo who joined in the Easter festivities as they were handed special Easter egg treats from their handlers. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your night.